Hello, welcome to The Long Road. My name is Chris Roberts. I'm here with my guest, Jamie Collins. And I think you seem to have one of the toughest jobs in the state right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not getting any easier. Yes, we have some real challenges facing us. And can you explain to the audience what your position is? I'm the CEO of Monadnock Family Services, a wonderful organization that I, I uh, joined about three years ago. I moved here uh, and began as their chief operating officer, and we went through a lot of changes. And um, when Ken Ju, longtime CEO, retired a year ago, uh, the board chose me mm -hmm. to move into the leadership role. And I've been in that position since January of last year. <coughs> It's a pretty tough act to follow Ken Jude. He's almost been the, the face of it forever. He certainly <laughs> has. And he was a big part of the reason that I chose to come here, his national reputation mm -hmm. in, in innovative programming with his incredible In Shape mm -hmm. program, which I'm sure people in the community mm -hmm. are familiar with. Um, and I was looking for an opportunity where innovation and prevention were combined in the delivery of behavioral health services, which is really important. Um, when the dollars to provide those services continue to shrink. I had not expected how quickly <laughs> they would shrink in New Hampshire, I must say. <laughs> well, I think you, you hit on an, an important key was prevention. <clears throat> because a lot of places around the country, you get paid by the number of clients, not the quality of the service, services. And it isn't just about collecting money, it's about prevention and helping the clients to get back on a meaningful life. Very insightful, Chris. <laughs> Have you worked in the field? <laughs> yes, that's very accurate that there's, there's quite a, a discrepancy throughout mm. the field. And having worked in community mental health mm. settings my entire career, um, I've been very aware of, of how unfortunate it, it is that Often consumers who desperately are needing our services um, really don't have a sense of how to evaluate mm -hmm. a quality service from a non-quality service. So to try to really uh, come up with the most meaningful programming that impacts a person's life in the shortest amount of service um, is something that uh, hopefully can be replicated across the country and begin to standardize the field in a positive way. Right. Um, but the prevention issue, if you're going to have a meaningful treatment, prevention really needs to be an aspect of that treatment so that the person uh, receiving that care can incorporate that into their daily life and prevent further setbacks. And defining prevention in mental health is a bit different from physical health care, and we just need to be more articulate and clear about what that really means, and that's, that's work that we're involved with. And the In Shape program is actually an example of that. Because if we put it really kind of forceful, you would much rather prevent the bullying or prevent the sexual trauma than have to pay to treat the results of it. Absolutely. An ounce of prevention. Absolutely. Yeah. And that will lead into kind of the governor and the, the new budget proposals, a lot of those prevention programs are basically going to be thrown out the window. So I'm hearing, well, <clears throat> it's proposed. It's proposed. Yes, very concerning. It is because I don't think um, people understand prevention. How do, you, how do you, when you sit there, in this, how do you put a dollar value on prevention? If if you go in and your organization treats four individuals and say it costs $20,000, but you keep them out of jail, which is going to cost us $18,000 per person if, just if they were in for six months, we don't, we don't match them up together. It's like, well, this is 20000 bucks. Show me what you're getting out of it. You, they don't allow you to go and say, well, I've saved, statistically, I saved you 72000 bucks. That's an excellent example. And people who are um, incarcerated because of their behaviors mm -hmm. or reincarcerated because they did not change their behaviors after they were released from incarceration, that actually is something that people can study and measure. There is a dollar amount attached mm -hmm. to that. Um, things such as um, keeping individuals safe and 
um, helping them have less, more, more manageable, more functional lives on an individual level. Um, being part of the community safety net, helping prevent uh, folks from doing desperate things when they're feeling desperate, um, that's a little harder to measure. Uh, but certainly when you look at communities like Tucson and around the country when, when things do uh, happen, when they occur, uh, there's a random nature, they're um, very um, lethal, and yet, when you look back and study what led up to that occurrence, oftentimes, this is not to place any blame, but oftentimes, uh, there were opportunities for meaningful intervention that did not occur for a number of reasons. And when we talk about trying to move prevention forward in the mental health field, um, there's the individual preventative kinds of behaviors that a person can manage their own illness or their own concerns. And then there's the broader community kind of interventions with prevention, many that you're familiar with uh, for uh, children, uh, young folks to not abuse alcohol and drugs. Those are very standardized over the decades. But to think more specifically about how to educate the public in a way that they can be supportive to folks that their paths might cross with. When you look at um, the Tucson example, uh, where this young man was in a university setting, what were the options as people were seeing troubling signs? What did they understand about what their options were to, for intervention? Um, and to start to identify uh, what those options are and begin to look at how to intervene in a way that the general public simply does not know. Um, we're looking to bring a program to the Keene, uh, actually our entire catchment area, which is Cheshire and part of Hillsboro, our 35 towns. Um, we're hoping to later this year present a program called Mental Health First Aid. And it's a community education kind of format where we can provide uh, education about the mental health system, about what mental illness looks like, someone in crisis, so that if you know uh, CPR and you walk yeah. upon someone who's having a heart attack, you have some idea what to do. Um, and you hope there's others around also that do. Um, the idea of mental health first aid is very similar, um, but these are very foreign kinds of interventions and uh, understandings that I think some public education will go a long way in helping not only our communities be safer, but the individuals that we would help would remain safer also and hopefully not do anything that would be harming to themselves or others. And when you talk you talk about mental health. Again, a lot of things we have stereotypes. We look at um, homeless people, jobless people, and they go, maybe that's just a lower income. And what I did was I went to um, the Wall Street Journal had um, a really good article on um, when family mental health unbalanced. <clears throat> and I, I got this one from a lawyer. I've had, had to deal with numerous incidents of a bizarre behavior caused by my spouse's bipolar disorder. As a lawyer, the manic episodes always came at the worst possible moments in the middle of a trial business meetings. I have never been able to discuss the condition with co-workers, bosses, or family because of the stigma attached. I have often been trust in the role of a single parent on a moment's notice. I once had to fly 800 miles to bring my spouse back home because they had want, she had wandered away in a bipolar state and got back in time to lead a management conference the next day. I have led this double life for 20 years, and it's taken a physical and mental toll. I mean, this is not someone that's homeless. This is a high-powered lawyer who is just struggling to keep his family to, together, but he's so embarrassed because of the stigma that society would place on him if he told anybody that his wife had a mental illness. So he, if he goes... He, has no, he doesn't know how his kids are going to be taken care of. His wife can go in crisis just like that. So the program that you're talking about, if people knew about it and they could see that she was going, they could give some of that kind of first aid to prevent it from going farther on. But I don't think people realize some of the stresses that, that go on. That's such a powerful example. And when you really stop and think about stigma and the discrimination that is around stigma, Often it's a lack of understanding, and this this you know person explains it well that 
he's embarrassed for people to know. No. He's protecting his wife from people knowing. And a big part of that is people don't understand mental illness, um, are uncomfortable with it. Um, and most uh, often um, we, we pull back from, we try to avoid, we uh, make assumptions about things we don't understand. And, uh, you know, in, at this point in history, uh, how odd. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, it's just odd to me. Of course, to me, I, I, I would deal with it every day. Uh, it's just, it's really unfortunate. And we have such a far way to go. So, you know, I think any education in, that we can do in general society to start to demystify, to start normalizing it. Um, bipolar is a very uh, chemically based disorder, imbalance. And while it may look odd to people who have not been around it, there's pretty predictable kinds of behaviors and interventions and responses that help the person stabilize in a reasonable amount of time. And it's not that different than physical illness, and yet we simply do not understand it well enough to feel comfortable with it. And I, I think as a community mental health provider, especially as we have fewer dollars to do the individual service, we really will try to uh, do some broad-based education so that folks can be more embraced in their community and their families and their, um, by their neighbors. But the, one of the things with... Um the mental health as I was going through a number of them, a lot of it is your financial resources. If people who have financial resources or they have a good mental <clears throat> um, health care plan which treats mental illness just as a physical illness, the people can get treatment and get on with their lives. But there's, there's a lot of people who don't have that ability, don't even have the time. And we had one right here for a woman Two years ago, my son was diagnosed with a serious mental illness he, when he was four. At about the same time, my boss begged me to take a promotion. The extra money was really beneficial. However, my absence from work to deal with school and treatment issues and my own emotions stemming from the diagnosis led to performance issues, and now I have been demoted. <clears throat> Again, the cost. In, in both of these, what I'm getting is <clears throat> you had two healthy individuals who were thrown in a crisis because someone else's health, mental health issues, now they have mental health issues of, the, of their own. So how do they deal with their own mental health if they feel like they're the only provider and they must constantly be strong? Mm -hmm. A huge challenge, a huge challenge. And these are folks, in both of your examples, Thanks. with financial resources. Financial resources. The system is uh, not working <coughs> at many levels. And the the pressure that it puts on a family, uh, the pressure that it puts especially on a spouse, um, is really overwhelming. And and part of that is the there just is not a system to surround people and have them openly uh, pursue the kind of supports and care that they need. I think that if you think about any illness, the the sooner you intervene, uh, the better the prognosis. And if you think about something that has a huge stigma around it and is um, not understood by many people, then even the family members may put off the intervention as long as they can, and then it's probably harder to, you know, get back to normal um, than prior to the onset of that um, incident. <clears throat> but the, the other string, if, if I go outside and I slip and fall, and I break both of my legs and an arm, people go, wow, you're hurt, you're injured. If a month ago, I had a really bad concussion. So, but if I have a, a bad concussion or some, no one sees anything, you're healthy. So I'm either faking it or it's not real. It's, we haven't been able to say, mental illness is just the same as a physical illness and sometimes can be much worse, but because you can't see it, you really have no right to tell someone it doesn't exist. Exactly. And you know, uh, you're, you're moving into one of the bigger challenges about the returning veterans, are their invisible war wounds, which um, 
where you're, I didn't want to change subjects on you, <laughs> but um, the, the, PT, the post-traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. these very, um, these traumatic brain injuries that um, we, we brought a, a presentation to our annual meeting this year in the community uh, and provided some community video follow-up when we heard about the escalating suicide rate among returning and active mm -hmm. veterans. And so uh, Colonel Philbrick from the Pentagon mm -hmm. agreed to come up and do a presentation here. And uh, he showed us actual MRI brain scans of uh, some of the veterans who have these traumatic brain injuries. And in fact, their brains can show the same activity level as someone in a coma. And yet they're able to walk and function in, a, in some way that looks relatively normal, and yet they have this injury that um, has impacted their life terribly. And violent imber outbursts, you know, result from those kinds of injuries and predictable behavior. And yet, because they look normal, um, people are not understanding uh, the impact of these kinds of injuries. They're very complicated. Um, so, to you know, everyone wants to know. You know, how can I be supportive of the veterans? And our <coughs> message that we're trying to promote is, is to really begin to understand and learn about um, what kind of challenges our veterans are having as they try to return to civilian life um, and why suicides begin to come from that stress that uh, they're dealing with a lot. And those are some pretty invisible wounds often. The, the more visible ones, as you said, just like your own concussion, <laughs> the visible <laughs> ones people get. It's those uh, more subtle ones that are such a challenge and often um, really impact their lives. The, um, I, for, I understand completely what you're saying. I have a 40% rating on traumatic brain injury. And because of my dramatic brain injury, that's why sometimes my <clears throat> my speaking gets gets messed up, or I get the distance there, or sometimes I'll be talking to people, and it's like you can see the warning says, "Okay, just stop and you, you go away," or you, you look at people's faces and say, "Wait a minute, you know, oh, the words are not coming out," because sometimes what you think you're saying and what you're saying isn't actually coming out, yeah, and it's com it's completely frustrating. And as a result, of them, I had two strokes. I had a whole bunch of um, t TIAs or the sh mini strokes. And then I take a whole bunch of medicine to keep the seizures under control. And so all of a sudden you find out all these things that you couldn't do anymore. You, you, you have to find other things. But the thing is, people look at you and say, wow, you're really healthy. And it's kind of like, well, if I was really healthy, I wouldn't be doing a TV show. I wouldn't be in politics. I would be doing what I was trained to do. And, but you, you adjust, but the idea is working with the veteran so he or she can adjust and so they can find better things to do. And people, don't, people understand that it causes some serious problems that it frustrates people. And people look at you, oh, nothing wrong with you, nothing wrong with you. Yeah, there is, there is something wrong. And... We need to do more and more for the individuals. And I, don't, I just don't think people understand the traumatic impact. I don't think they do, and it's much, I don't think this is quite the same uh, issue as mental illness, but be, because it has uh, such a direct relationship to suicide and um, emotional and mental con yep. strife that the returning veterans are trying to live with. It's in our field, and as a community mental health provider, I think that we one of the um, ways to support those folks who have served, uh, you know, given their mental health uh, to, to defend our country and uh, done so willingly, our, our best way to help a veteran is to understand uh, how that's impact their life now. And it's, it's complicated. And, you know, just your own story as you were telling that. I mean, that has a lot of very minute kinds of impacts and twists and turns there. Very complicated. <laughs> and yet you do, an, you know, obviously an outstanding job to manage it and overcome those symptoms. And but yet, I'm one of the lucky ones. Well, yes, I would say so. And, and 
I think that uh, you just want people to, to know about it and know that some are not able to overcome as eloquently as you have at this point. So to, to have that information out there, you know, I, I'm hearing things that uh, this, is, this is such a unique war situation that it's, it's something that people can easily not think about. <coughs> just kind of block it out. If you don't know someone that's serving, it's kind of like, oh, until you see someone in the airport in uniform, you know. It's not like, <laughs> like if you didn't see it on the news, it's not in your mind. And I think the statistics, Tom Brokaw's <laughs> launching a, a campaign to raise uh, public <laughs> awareness and was talking about how 1% of the population is taking 100% of the responsibility of of do you know being in this war and having the effects of it in their families um, and the families have many challenges that the VA system right now is overwhelmed by so that comes back to community mental health so everyone touching the lives of the veterans family has a role to play in supporting and understanding and helping families get back on track when they when they try to reunite um, so the, the challenges are huge, and the more our community can have a raised awareness, I think the more they can just play a role in providing the support and understanding that is so important in, in that reintegration, because understanding is a huge part of that. When you understand something, you're just going to be much more uh, em empathic and supportive than if it's just all a mystery to you. And the the other thing which is different about this war compared to other wars, the number of National Guard and reservists that take part. Oh, well, yes. When I went yes. to the first Gulf War, and <clears throat> I got medevac to Langstool and all the other ones that spent about six weeks in the hospital. and then the fo It took about two years of follow-up treatment. But I still had my house. I still had my paycheck every two weeks. Everything was taken. All those other stress of being a father or a husband, Trying to, there was no financial stress there. Hmm. So, but if just think if you're a National Guard or a Reserve, you go away, you come back. Within two to three weeks, you could be home. And if you're a fireman or a policeman or someone, you have one, you're not good enough or physically ready or mentally ready enough to go back to the job. Guess what? No money. <clears throat> what do you do? How do you take care of you? How do you pay your bills? How do you keep a roof? All those extra stress. <clears throat> I mean, active duty guys don't have that. Reservists and National Guard have that. So if you're a living team, your, your organization is going to have to maybe the only organization that's going to be able to provide them help. And that's, you know, that's why we found ourselves developing that service, <laughs> because it would have been easier to say, you know, if you're a veteran, you need to get over to the VA hospital. <laughs> and yet, uh, that's a challenge. They're building things closer. We're going to have some more mm. services yeah. here in Keene, I understand, yeah. soon. And that's <laughs> wonderful. Um, but the challenges are just so complex. And so the homeless rate is on the rise. Veterans being incarcerated they, when they, you know, uh, get involved in something often because uh, an addiction has yeah. developed in their response to cope or the financial piece yeah. has led them in directions they might not otherwise have gone. And so when you have a chance to intervene, sometimes by the time we intervene, the picture is so complicated and the person is so overwhelmed and has gone so low. <laughs> you know, you have to kind of do the social uh, supports to help the person rediscover a normal kind of life before you can even intervene on the, the war injuries. Um, it's just, you know, this is, this is a big, big issue that I, th I really uh, am, am hoping that that the public awareness as it rises will impact a number of things because many of the programs that actually are supporting veterans and others who are homeless um, and having complicated, complex needs, all of those are on the chopping block at the state budget in New Hampshire right now. And that's a very concerning picture. I, I just find it um, <clears throat> really scary. And one of the things that... Um, <clears throat> 
that I found w was totally disgusting. <laughs> when um, <clears throat> this one had just recently, lawmaker abdicate eugenics in bid to save money. And this is almost kind of out, right out of, um, I'll be blunt, this is what Hitler did during um, prior to World War II and II. He says, well, if you were defective, you had no purpose, we would need to get rid of you. And when we go in, and how do I put the quote, it says, <clears throat> you know, those mentally ill, the retarded people with physical disabilities and drug addictions, the defective people of society would be better off without. And, and it just, I was irritated because who gives anybody the decision or the power to decide who is beneficial to society and who isn't. And <clears throat> um, I was in the, the chamber where the testimony was occurring and what I, my first reaction, if you'd like for me to relive yeah. that for a moment, <laughs> was um, I was so impressed by the number of people who very courageously mm. walk, came forward mm. to say, you know, to the legislators, you just don't get it. You just don't okay. understand what our challenges are. And they actually, many of them had brought their extremely disabled children in extended wheelchairs and, uh, you know, needing help to breathe. Just, uh, But they came in with the dignity that they had. They walked in that room and they looked these folks in the eye and said, you know, this is our situation and you're talking about doing something that is really going to be life-threatening. And so it, w it was very moving. And um, it was someone in, who had contacted this new representative who stood up and read her email that she had received from him. And, you know, it, it really kind of rallied the room in a positive way, I guess, in that everyone came together and was so reactive to what they were hearing. And yet, just uh, it just is a message coming from someone who is going to be voting on this budget that they would publicly say something like this. Um, it just, it takes the wind out of you, appalls you. It just, it was a very intense Those are polite words. moment. Those are very polite words, you're right. Um, but it, it was it was really a moment that people will not forget when they heard uh, his words in that room that day. He was not there to say them. Um, but, you know, I have read a follow-up message or um, interview where he was contacted by, I believe it was the Concord paper. Yeah. And um, he, he mentioned that he was joking. That was in the article. That in the future he would not joke that way. He'd given thought to that anyway. Um, that in fact um, he doesn't know what to do. Now, Frankly, that was the best thing I'd heard so far, that he's really expressing in a very vulgar way that he's, he's totally overwhelmed with what this state is going to do. He's got himself in office. He has a responsibility. <laughs> they bring to him this problem that truly is life and death for some people and quality of life for everyone. And he's being faced with something. This is a man who's probably used to knowing how to fix things. <laughs> and he's saying he really doesn't know what to do and that he joked by saying, well, let's ship a to Siberia or what, you know, whatever ridiculous thing he said. But that, in, if, if he could just be that honest and move forward with that message, that would be something. Probably what concerned me the most is that many of his colleagues were trying to make excuses for him and yeah. that he was confused <clears throat> and, you know, this He's and that. The one, we have a book that lists all the legislators. I just got a copy of it. And my personal opinion, he wasn't joking. That's just mine mm -hmm. because he, he feels that we need to do away with all schools, put kids in army barracks. That's how you educate them. <clears throat> and I'm pretty flexible, but there's certain things you just don't joke about. And if people are not laughing, it's, it's not a joke. Mm -hmm. And 
So I, he's made public comments before. Does that make you wonder how he got elected <clears throat> if, in fact, this is the representation that part of the state wanted? And that could, that's very concerning. The part, and when you're talking about it, where um, he says part of that Hitler did something right, and I agree with it. It's one thing to to say it once, but then when you go and repeat that, because um, <clears throat> he was called back by them to ask if um, if he actually did say it, and he said nature has a way of getting rid of stupid people, and now we're saving everyone who gets born. <clears throat> there's four and five the joke went way too long if, even if it was a really nasty foul joke mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the guy's 91 years old and they're saying well he, he should get a bye because um, he served during World War II yeah he served during World War II as a supply clerk <clears throat> you've done your homework yeah, yeah. I did 21 years in, in the Marine Corps as an officer and never ever did I get the uh, even thought that I would have the right to determine who I felt was productive or not. No, it was my responsibility to give everybody the right to be the best they can. Now, and the other one was where the speaker goes, I would certainly hope in the future Representative Hardy would choose his words more carefully. Yeah, <laughs> that's <clears throat> but, not encouraging, is it? But to me, certain things are so foul that you've got to distance as, as far as possible, not telling the individual to choose their words better, because this has hurt a lot of people. Well, emotionally, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, as far as the uh, conversation <laughs> that it has generated since that, um, I'm not so sure. I mean, of course, I'm doing my part to make sure it gets a positive twist because what it really opened up with dialogues with many people who I've crossed yep. paths with is the debate on is there a responsibility that our legislature has or is this kind of thinking a direction the state is moving by these kinds of severe, severe, I mean, these are profound <laughs> cuts that they're proposing to the health and human services in this state. Now... The fact is, our, there is some checks and balances in the, in the system. And if these cuts really happen the way they're talking about, you know, the fact is the federal government mandates Makes. states to do a certain yeah. amount of, provide a certain level of care for its most vulnerable citizens. And those are in a number of different categories of protected uh, populations. And if New Hampshire continues down that road, I think they're inviting some federal lawsuits um, to protect. Now, that will be a sad moment in history that that's what it will take for the state to do <laughs> basically <clears throat> what they are mandated, what is basic human rights, care. Um, it has happened in other states, and it can happen here. The problem is there will be um, a, an, an unbelievable amount of human suffering while the courts fight this. You people know, while, will die while the courts fight. Yes, they will. And people, people will needlessly die. Yes. <clears throat> and it's one of, I just don't think that any of us have the, the right to judge the value of a person. For example, Stephen Hawkins, one of the most intelligent individuals that ever lived, he would have never been able to get out of childhood just looking at as something as that guy who's been confined to a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but he's right up there at Einstein and some of the other individuals. <clears throat> so that's what it upset me. It, it upset me because it was yes. totally, <clears throat> you, you just don't do that. And... Um, because we have a lot of people who have either physical or mental disab disabilities mm -hmm. of not of their choosing. I could see differently if I went out and got drunk, didn't have a helmet, and I suffered a severe hair injury. I had a choice. I, <clears throat> I took a part in that happening. But there's a lot of people, they were born. They had a birth detect. They didn't have a choice, and they're trying to make the best they can out of it. And they're only asking us for 
a little help. They're not asking us to do everything for them. They're just saying, give me the opportunity to help myself. Give me the opportunity to be independent. It, you know, that, that was really, I think that's one thing that made this more heinous, <laughs> these comments, that the, the people in the room who were asking to be heard uh, were really arguing for basic human rights. Basic. Not, you know, anything above the basics. <laughs> and um, even the person, even, you know, the person who's in the automobile or motorcycle rack, you know, I suppose, some choice. Um, and yet um, they will require some level of care. Yeah. Is, does, should that yeah. mean that they're not entitled to anything? Um, I don't know what our leaders are thinking. Um, this is my first real uh, <coughs> immersion into the <laughs> legislature in New Hampshire. And um, I know there is a very large number of people representing uh, the state. And yet, in that group, where is the leadership? I mean, this is a voice. This is a this man who has this opinion that is so um, negative and horrifying. Actually, um, he has a voice when he wants it to be heard. Um, where are the leaders in, in this number of people who are in public office? There has to be some leadership up there that can band together and make the right things happen. And yet, um, you're there. Yeah. You're, you're doing your part. Where are your colleagues that will, you know, make it stronger? I think when you're talking about this, even out of the most negative and heinous speech, you can have some positivity. And I think this has gotten a lot of people off their butts. I think a lot of people are realizing, holy crap, we just can't sit on the side. Else we're just going to get plowed over. That's, that's my prayer. And <clears throat> because when you're talking about the governor and the governor is was going to be about $600 million below what you needed. Representative Kurt, I was reading when he asked for about the $400 million cut, and he goes, well, I was kind of like just joking. I just threw that number up in the air. Oh, really? <clears throat> and so he, he throws the number up in the air. The commissioner goes and gets that number, and now it says, oh, good, we're not going to do everything, but we'll use a bunch of what you, most of what you turned in. And so I'm, I'm going to myself, that, that could end up being almost a billion dollars worth of cuts. A billion dollars. And when you think of a lot of stuff that we do around the state, we're going to build um, <clears throat> better um, rest areas so we can sell more booze to the people coming through. Oh, are we? But, quote, unquote, I guess that's good money. <laughs> or we'll, we'll build more roads so more people, tourists, can come in. But that's good money. But spending money to help people is not really good money. It, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense. And when you look at the homeless, you get the homeless in Keene. We've got four shelters. They're all full. And again, but don't you know? The good news is we have four shelters in yeah. Keene, and they're all full. And yet, um, one of the um, d shelter directors testified uh, from Keene and talked about before his shelter opened this year, a person came in and they gave them what they could because all the other shelters were full. And he later froze to death, uh, yep. sleeping out in this tent they had given him. And yet, you can probably name the cases because... It's really mm. well supported mm. here. I mean, there's yep. some incredible work going on. Now, they're all up for cuts. <laughs> so what would next winter look like? And, you know, I, I, there, there will, I hope it doesn't have to be a human suffering backlash because mm -hmm. as people, uh, as things happen and, you know, oh, gee, I guess that social mm -hmm. service stuff worked after all, you know, and as the quality of life is impacted for everyone, mm -hmm. Um, desperate people do desperate things. And so, um, you know, people without shelter, people without uh, emotional and mental mm -hmm. health help, 
um, people without medications. Uh, things will happen that will affect the quality of life for everyone here. And then, you know, maybe that will prove some point or who knows where it would go with that. But the suffering that will happen before it would get to that or as it goes to that is, is just, um, it's just unbelievable. When you're talking about medications. When you look mm -hmm. at the number of people that are in the, um, <clears throat> the county um, correctional facility, mm -hmm. and a lot of them have mental health issues, and the first time they received mental health treatment while was, while was in being locked up, and being on the, um, the county board, the county delegate, where you see that sometimes once the people are let go, that's the end of their medicine. And they make progress, they're getting on a thing, it's, okay, you're out, no more medicine, no nothing, then how do you expect someone to get a job if they can't be on their meds? And so what do they do? They end right back up in the um, correctional facility. That money is undecided as we speak. I was <coughs> um, at a meeting this morning mm. listening to the debate about that because the county's struggling now yeah. to come up with their portion of things. And, and there's a wonderful mental health court that exists in this uh, community um, that provides follow-up services that are paid for for a period of time to help someone reintegrate mm -hmm. back into the community. That, that transition back is such a critical piece that it, it makes or breaks everything. And enlightened people here know that. And yet the dollars that it's going to take to run this county <laughs> are stretched beyond stretched and the state is of course passing down some of their responsibilities so can programs like that continue to exist um, like I said it's on the chopping block here locally because when you look at Keene <laughs> when you look at the safety net or just the community involvement whether it's 2020 the hospital your organization numerous other organizations numerous businesses that donate we have created a safety net. We've created value in all our people. Everybody who wants to take part, we have something that can help them. In a lot of ways, we're the envy of a lot part of the rest of the state. We certainly have been so far. <clears throat> I, I hope that's not in jeopardy. Um, the safety net piece is so critical and has done so efficiently here. We, we designed our own, we redesigned our own role in that just a couple of years ago. Um, and with support that we've pieced together to help underwrite it through the county, the city, uh, the towns, and very much the United Way. We're able to provide a very meaningful service for anyone, regardless of their ability to pay. Um, when they call in within 10 days, they're able to come in and have a complete psychological workup and some short-term therapy that follows. That's to intervene when the person reaches out. And there's that small window of time oftentimes that people will reach out. And if you don't have a timely, something timely to offer them, they usually don't reach out again. <laughs> you know, they move on to something else because people who are under stress are, you know, sometimes really uh, challenged to, you know, keep moving in a positive direction. And so when that happens, it's important for us to be available. And, you know, this is such an enlightened community that they step up and help support that, and yet the community is really being stretched it's right now financially. We're going to see if we're going to have be able to keep this going at the same um, intensity. But we have provided service to so many people who have expressed how life-changing and life-altering that is. And, and again, when you look back at some of these domestic violence shootings and you know, these reactive things that people do when they're uh, unemployed, they may have started drinking, they may be violent, they, you know, they've made lots of bad choices and people die in those situations. Sometimes uh, people, uh, you know, not the non-spouse, the, the fellow that had driven up to the Target mm -hmm. store and started shooting people as he went in to mm -hmm. kill his ex-wife and then himself. Um, that's a nationally known story. When you, when you go backwards in that story, he had reached out one time to go to therapy and was put on a waiting mm -hmm. list because he didn't have insurance. But 
that's the that's the moment you grab and offer something that can be life changing, and it's happening here. Um, I think that the safety net, you know, in states where they make the cuts and. Uh, There's people uh, making the decisions that don't understand or um, don't consider it their responsibility. I have spoke to a colleague (laughs) in uh, Texas last week, and he said that some of the new members in his legislature had renamed the safety net the safety hammock, (laughs) that people just, you know, are lounging around and taking advantage of social services. Um, I think that sometimes some of those reputations are earned by some of our providers in that, you know, they find a funding source and keep it rolling. Um, What our part of accountability is, is that if we're going to offer a service, it needs to be efficient and effective. And if it's not, then we're not doing our role. But if it's efficient and effective, it certainly can change lives and it can save lives. (coughs) Down about 10 minutes, but two things I want to cover in the changing mental health issues with, with children because they're feeling, even thought that we were talking about before, even thought the parents don't under, realize it a lot of times, the kids are, are under a lot of mental health pressure because of what's happening to the parents. The second part is that group in the 45 to 55 who've worked for some point 20, 30 years, all of a sudden their lives come crashing down because the business is um, closed, there's no more jobs or whatever, and it's just really tra- creating issues. Mm-hmm. How are you dealing with those two groups, even though they're on the different ends of the extremes? Well, those are two interesting <laughs> groups you just pulled out. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that 45 to 55, basically you're talking unemployment, yep. uh, response to the recession, Um, people are finding themselves without jobs, without careers that certainly was on a steady career path, and the bottom dropped out of it. A lot of people, that was their identity. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, however resilient you are, if that was your plan, you probably didn't have (coughs) plan B. (laughs) And um, I think... um, it's very common. I mean, you can pretty much assume that people go through a number of emotions when that has happened. Um, our agency has gone through change that is in, just to get more efficient um, before any of this started to happen. Change is, really goes against people's nature. <laughs> you know, uh, there's things I want to change about myself right now, but I just don't get around to it because it's too much trouble. I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's unsettling. Um, so people, again, when you go back to human nature and change that is put upon someone, there's shock, there's denial. No money, no health care, no future. Yes, then all of the consequences that immediately start to pile up on the person. Um, It probably changes their standard of living very quickly, and if they do not react to that, in the most effective way, it just Domestic snowballs violence, much more violence. quickly. Absolutely. And desperate people do desperate, desperate things. things. People who are not thinking clearly or are depressed often don't make wise choices. Mm-hmm. Um, if you find something that feeds that denial, mm-hmm. like addiction, uh, that just you know takes over everything. Mm-hmm. Um, it's certainly a family illness at that point. Um, and that's, that was really the, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's an irony that that sold so quickly to this community, the idea that, that an acute kind of service, a very efficient, quick intervention, if someone reached out to us could really be life changing for that person and really keep people safe in the community, whether it's in the home or in society that for, for people to be so enlightened and understand that so quickly and deeply and want to support their, you know, friends and neighbors in the community, for a community like this to exist in a state that is doing what it's doing <laughs> just really makes my head hurt. <laughs> but then the, the countless children who are victims of the family stress and... You know, children just are little sponges. 
the uh, home is often seen as kind of the eye of the hurricane and yet it's it becomes a very dangerous situation often because what happens behind closed doors uh, you know it's it's private and it's uh, it's that totally within control of that family and it's it's interesting you raise that because I heard something on the radio this morning that just sent chills down my spine and I think it was local radio uh, just kind of threw in one of those human interest <laughs> stories. Uh, someone had done a study about um, fathers who are now um, in increasing numbers are spanking their very, very young children because they're depressed. Yep. And <coughs> that they don't, when you're depressed and, so, you know, if you're self focused, if you're just on edge, um, of course, normal child behavior uh, would be more irritating probably than normal, and yet you're not always thinking clearly either or having total control of your behavior. And to lash out at these very young children um, and possibly causing bodily harm that may cripple the child, where's that going to go? That's, I mean, now you've got this uh, situation that has been multiplied endlessly by your actions. Uh, you've uh, damaged the life of your precious child. Um, so, you know, the concern is that things that happen under those stressful times, <coughs> under those desperate situations, that's not going to take just an intervention. That's going to take generations to heal from and overcome the kind of damage that can happen in a split second. And when <coughs> it's, but you have these guys who've lost their self-identity, they've lost their self-esteem, self-value, then it almost comes like the Lord of the Fly. I want to have power over somebody. And, and a lot of times the innocent children, the defenseless child is the person that, that, that's preyed upon. Absolutely. Child abuse, spouse abuse, those things just escalate incredibly uh, under those kinds of conditions. And we know that. We know that. And we can prevent it. Yes, we can. We can certainly go a long way to reach out. Un uh, just assume that these are high-risk situations in families who are hurting and find effective ways to reach out. <coughs> and again, an ounce of prevention. I should keep talking while you're drinking. <clears throat> I've said it a couple of times on other shows and talking to other people. <clears throat> Sometimes people can cause trouble just by how they look at somebody. <clears throat> and they do it unintentionally. If I go in and tell someone I'm disabled, they look at me. <clears throat> you know, you can see the look. Hmm. But if I go and say, well, I'm a retired Marine colonel, totally different look. Wow. It is just totally different. <clears throat> and then I go, well, I get injured <clears throat> in, in the war. So they go, oh, your government can't do it too much for you. We need to do more and more for you. But in all three situations, I'm the exact same person. Isn't that? Yeah. But depending on what I tell the people... In either one of those situations, they will all treat me differently. <clears throat> they will not look at me as the person. And so I'm lucky I'm a retired colonel. But look at these other people who may have lost their job or whatever. They said, well, I'm an unemployed engineer. You can just people will give that look instead of saying, well, oh, yeah, you're Chris. I know you. That's right. Yeah, you used to work for the company. Yeah, the company went out of business. That's not your fault. Im but, unemployed implies something, doesn't it? We yes. don't immediately real think of them as a victim. Why are they unemployed? Yeah. Which, I mean, <clears throat> you get it, but I think sometimes the immediate response Bunch. is... And I think we, we're doing some of that trouble when mm -hmm. someone goes and says, well, I may think up the courage and say, hey, I have bipolar, I'm taking my medications, I'm trying to get back. We should be patting them on the back for taking control and trying to be successful. But sometimes we just give them that look. Well, you're gonna, that look's going to reflect that you don't really know what that means, probably. 
It's a big <coughs> question mark. And so, but I just think, you know, the best thing we can do for people is treat people as people, not judge them. And so, okay, we have Good 30 point. seconds left. Do you have anything to say? We have 30 seconds. We went quick. Well, I think that the more that uh, people understand <coughs> mental illness, I think the more they understand anything about a person who's struggling with mental and emotional issues, the more fair they will be when they relate with them. Well, thank you. It went really quick. And for the guests, I hope you enjoyed the show. And if they Very need much. to contact you, they can contact you. We'll put the number up. And so we'll see you on the long road. Go to down.